In that case, we can move on to contrastive multi-view coding. You are going to be hearing the contrastive word for a while. And the reason I'm doing it is because I want to look at it from different perspective and understand it deeper and deeper. We all know that we perceive objects through different views. Not only we see them, but also we hear them and we feel them. And sometimes we touch them. It's the same object, but you're approaching it from different perspectives. Let's forget about the multimodal nature of this and focus only one on one mode, perhaps vision. You can look at the same thing from different angles. And then this is going to give you M views of the same object. And each data, you can, these are data sets, different views of your data set. And you can sample from each one of those data sets. That's what that notation means. We know about uh, uh, autoencoders. We actually went beyond them and recovered variation autoencoders, which was stochastic autoencoders. But this is very old concept from 1980 or before. And this is for unsupervised learning. You take a representation of your image, perhaps black and white, you featureize it, you take your features and you want to reconstruct perhaps some other, the color channel or the luminance channel. Or it could be the same image, the other image, this could be the same image plus noise, and the other image is the ground truth. And then you write down your usual mean squared error loss function. If this is a bottleneck type of a structure, you go from high resolution to low resolution, low resolution to high resolution, then you're encoding some knowledge, hopefully in Z. There is nothing wrong with this structure, but it's not going to give you a state-of-the-art performance when it comes to self-supervision. And as I said, this could be luminance and chrominance channel. Z is going to give us our V1 when you pushed it through your encoder. G is going to be the decoder. It's going to give you V2, the prediction of V2. Z is your latent variable. And then you want V2 to be similar to V2, the prediction to be similar to ground truth using one of these objective functions smooth L1, L1, L2, you name it. Nothing wrong yet, but what is the underlying assumption whenever you write mean squared error or sum of squared errors? You are assuming that this data is normally distributed and each pixel is independent from the pixel next to it. It is, if you have the normal distribution in the, nor in the formula for normal distribution, you have exponential. So it's gonna be the product of a bunch of exponentials you take a log of products that's going to turn into summation of the logs of exponentials. Log is going to cancel the exponential and then mean squared error is going to come out. That's where the sum of the squares or mean of squares is going to come out. The independence assumption is not such a great assumption here because this pixel could depend on the other pixel, even if you condition on the input or even if you condition on Z. And this is one of the reasons why autoencoders don't work that great when it comes to unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning. And this paradigm, if you have only one layer without any nonlinearity, is going to give you PCA if this is the same data, not two views, but the same data. But now you have two views, you're going to do predictive learning. You want to do contrastive learning and look at it from a different perspective. The neural network F is it still gonna take you from the image space to the Z space. The other neural network, you're gonna reverse it. Look at the arrow. This is going from left to right. The other one is going from right to left. And on the Z space, normality assumption and uh, independence assumptions are gonna make sense because your network is gonna work hard for that to happen. Let's pick a collection of samples from two views and let's pick N of them. Whenever you see the superscript I, these are the same image or the same object. You are looking at it from two different perspectives, perspective one, perspective two. If I is equal to I, these are the positive cases. These are basically the same image, which are coming from the joint distribution. If I is different to J, it means this is the second view of a different data. And these are gonna end up being negative cases. And it's coming from the product of marginals. X is a pair. Y is a pair, you have a positive pair in a set S and you have many negative pairs. Mm. And your task is to find the positive among K plus one negative. 
or among k plus one uh, pairs. This is where the contrastive loss is again gonna come in. We like our favorite uh, softmax function. We are gonna look at the cosine similarity between the pairs of images in the set X, the pairs of images in the sets Y. That's gonna give us an H function. And remember in H you have the exponential. So this is basically softmax. And then you are increasing the probability of finding the positive pair among a set of positives and negatives. And tau is a temperature, which is usually set to be 0 0.07. You do that using uh, hyperparameter optimization or using your validation data. I think uh, I'm gonna cover this also. How is this connected to mutual information? If you look at the paper, the details of the math or the proof doesn't really matter here. This function that you're writing ends up being, after a bunch of computation ends up being proportional to the ratio of the joint distribution and the marginal ones. And you see sort of why this is the joint distribution, these were the marginal distributions. So it's the ratio of the two. The numerator and this portion of the denominator is gonna give you the conditional distribution. And that is just the definition of mutual information. So H has something to do with mutual information. It turns out, that the mutual information at the pixel level is bigger than or equal to the mutual information at the Z level. So you have this data here, this other data here, you have two corresponding Zs, and it makes sense. You're losing some information as you go through your neural network. This inequality makes sense. The other inequality, you write it down, you expand it, and then there are some KL divergence that you ignore. And that's going to give you either than, bigger than or equal to a constant. This is where the size k comes in. The bigger is k, the better is going to end up being this approximation, this inequality. And this is the loss of the contrastive learning. This is the contrast loss. You want to minimize that, which is equivalent to maximizing the negative of the loss of the contrastive learning. It means that you're increasing the mutual information between these pairs of images. So whenever you're minimizing contrastive learning, you're maximizing the mutual information between one view and another view. I think I'm gonna stop here and continue the rest next session. Any questions? I'll be around.